And um, so let me, first of all, again, welcome and welcome to the first um, session of our uh, online um, IQIM uh, seminar. Um, just a, a few comments. We moved uh, the seminar on Thursday today for some logistical reasons. Um, we really have not decided whether we will keep the seminar at its usual hour on Friday at noon. Um, the reason is that Stanford is organizing an online MAO, um, MAO seminar which uh, some people won't attend to. Um, and now because um, of this online seminar, conflicting seminars became a bit harder to avoid, but we, we are trying to find out a new um, time slot that works. Um, let me give some instructions on how we thought this could work. Um, I ask of uh, all the participants who are not um, um, the speaker to keep their uh, microphone muted uh, during the talk so that um, you don't um, disturb the speaker. Um, but uh, we want to ask questions. So we, we are trying to have this uh, as, a, as a proper seminar so people should be allowed to, to ask questions at the end, but even during the talk, because this is how we usually do it. So uh, you have two options. You can write your question in the uh, chat window. You should find under the participant list, a small chat window. And if you write a question there for the speaker, uh, I can read it back to the speaker and I can um, um, ask the speaker the question you want to ask. Uh, the other option is if you want to interact with the speaker, um, there should be uh, an option under the participant list to raise your hand. There should be a blue hand button and once you push it, you should uh, um, a symbol should appear next to your name in the participant list. And this is signaling to me that you would like to speak. Um, if you do so, I will, as soon as the speaker gives us a pause, um, unmute you and you could ask your question yourself. Um, if it, I hope this is clear. If you have questions, again, feel free to write in the chat room and uh, um, Tefer, are you ready? Do, shall we start? Uh, yes, uh, let me set my timer and start. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. I, I, I think you don't need any introductions. You can introduce yourself, but um, thank you for okay. participating in our first online seminar. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm, yes. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Angelo and organizers for uh, starting this virtual seminar series, and I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Uh, so as Angelo says, feel free to write down the questions in between, and if I didn't stop for a question or didn't ask you for to initiate asking questions, please uh, write them and I will answer the questions. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Traverse of a wormhole, so the rotation by size and quantum gravity in the lab, which is a joint work with uh, Adam Brown, Ron Taribian, Stefan Leichenauer, Henry Lin, Grant Salton, Lorna Saskin, Brian Sungel, and Michael Walters. And uh, yes, and this is a work that uh, was done in Google X and Caltech along with uh, that I, I did when I was at Google X, but now I'm a postdoc at uh, Caltech as many as many of you guys know. So let me start by saying a few words on each, about the general motivation of our work. So the general motivation starts by understand, but this new understanding in the last, uh, last couple of years that quantum gravity is basically an emergent phenomenon, which is strengthened by, this idea has been strengthened by the holographic duality and basically it, it teaches us that certain systems of certain complex quantum systems that could be complex, chaotic, and more or less untractable with conventional techniques can have a holographic dual, which is a gravitational theory that could be understood, that could be simpler and cleaner. And in fact, as your quantum system gets more and more complex and intractable, this alternative description, this gravitational dual can get cleaner and more and more simple. So in this talk, 
Our goal is to understand this emergence of the gravitational system of this gravitational dual using the language of quantum information science. And we also want to provide experiments or at least move towards experiments whose simplest description go through this gravitational uh, understanding. So in other words, it's like you have a <coughs> complex quantum system with many degrees of freedom and you provide, and you write, uh, you make your quantum computer or experiments to simulate this complex quantum system that seems intractable. And this quantum system uh, happens to uh, have some features or properties or show some uh, some phenomena that's best understood or easier is easier to understand not with the conventional picture of your circuit but rather with uh with the gravitational picture of dual explanation of the circuit this is more or less uh, like uh the way that we communicate through sound waves so one way to understand the sound waves is to basically study all of this many, many number of atoms that interact with each other and in a very intractable and complex way. But the other description of the same phenomena involves sound waves, which is certainly much easier and simpler to understand. And we want to propose experiments which are best understood in the sound wave language and not in the individual atom language. So with this motivation, I'm going to go through the outline of my talk. First, I will talk about motivations and definitions. So I will start with briefly reviewing the holographic duality. We got to work for in the, within a certain setup in holographic duality. Holographic duality can talk about every geometry and many, many different states. But here we're going to focus on fix one geometry, which is a wormhole geometry, and study that. This is perfect for our purposes and proposing experiments. And then we're going to talk about the traversable wormholes that you can make by a, uh, uh, sorry, I have a question, I think. Yes, I'm talking about gauge gravity duality. So they're asking if this is a holographic duality. Uh, so I, I think it's not, the best way to organize this is that I let Angela ask questions because uh, I find it hard to stop and read the questions. So at yeah, the end of the- You should focus on your slides and then I would- Yeah, see, I find it very hard to focus on. Okay, thank you. I, I closed this uh, question window then. Yes, so then I will talk about the, uh, so as I said, I'm going to talk about holographic duality, wormhole geometry, and how you can make this wormhole geometry traversable. And then I'm going to talk about, so this is a review. I'm going to talk about our results, which is two regimes of teleportation. Given, the, given this gravity picture and its intuition uh, that we have for the gravity dual, we expect certain quantum systems to perform the teleportation task that's best understood by a signal going through a traversable wormhole in the dual picture. And we show that this teleportation happens in two regimes. One is an unexpected late time teleportation. This is something that gravity does, but it's not best understood by gravitational picture or by signal going through any wormhole. It's low capacity and it's easier to understand in a circuit picture. So this is the first regime. And the second regime is a teleportation, which is very much gravitational geometric and talks about the signal going through a wormhole. I'm going to talk about these two set of results, and then I'm going to talk comment on experiments. So uh, here in this part of the site, you see a number of uh, references for the previous work. This is certainly the traverse of wormholes and wormhole geometry was known before and it was a uh, important discovery. And many of these uh, protocols that we're gonna talk about, the simil protocols similar to what we're gonna talk about have been appeared in, in the, some of the previous work. So with that, I'm gonna, if there is any question. I don't know, maybe you want to readdress this question. I don't know if it was clear. Uh, it was not. Uh, the holographic quantum gravity duality is related to the gauge squared gravity duality. 
Uh, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think it's a gauge gravity duality. Uh, yes. So, is there any other question? I don't think so. You, I think you can. Yeah. Yes. So, I start with holographic duality and versions of space time. So this is a quick review of holographic duality or ideas of the correspondence. And it's basically telling us that certain complex quantum mechanical theories, which contain no gravity, have a dual description in terms of the theory of the quantum gravity. So in this picture, for example, you can see that this cylinder, uh, in the boundary of the cylinder you the, sits your non-gravitational quantum system, like this circle. And inside the can, inside the cylinder, is a gravitational dual of the same system. So in other words, whatever happens in the boundary and the circle has a dual description in terms of a, uh, in terms of a gravitational system that sits inside, inside the cylinder. And the time direction is same upward for the bulk and boundary. But in this talk, I'm not going to talk about the cylinder type of geometry. And instead, I'm going to talk about uh, a simple case when the boundary theory, when the non-gravitational system, is simply two point light objects extended in time. This is this red lines are a non-gravitational system. And it happens to be the case that the dual gravitational picture is a sheet of paper between these two boundaries. So this is, a, this is one boundary, this is another boundary, this is a gravitational picture, and the time goes upward in both pictures. And as I said, the time should go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So if you have t equal to minus infinity on the lower left and lower right, t equal to zero sit in, sits in the middle, and t equal to infinity is at the top. And as you can see, in, in order to draw this infinite space-time in this uh, finite slide, I had to uh, deform my infinite space-time in a nice way using some conformal mapping to squeeze everything in, in, in a finite region. And this is done according to the rules of something called Penrose diagrams. So now this is a complete picture, but this is to make sure that uh, you remember that everything is slightly deformed and this is an actually an infinite line and infinite space time, but it's just like drawn in a piece of paper. And this Penrose diagram is not totally arbitrary. And in fact, it preserves something. And the thing is that the speed of light, the light still travels at 45 degree angle. So this is trajectory of the light. And all other things which travel at speed slower than the speed of light go upward. It's just like this is the, this region is the light cone of any particle originated here. So this is another fact about the Penrose diagrams. And uh, now I have to argue for you that this thing that I draw here looks like a wormhole geometry. And the reason they call it the wormhole is uh, to, to argue that this is a wormhole geometry. We can, uh, you, you remember I said that this, the boundary is two point light object and this is a line inside the geometry extended in time. But this is not necessary to assume that it's a point light object. And in fact, it could be an extended uh, thing. And it could be the extended objects like a sphere or a circle on the boundary. And each point in the ball could be also be a, an extended object. And we are only, we assume that we are only suppressing the angular directions and other dimensions when we draw this diagram. So for example, you can assume that this, every point in this diagram is a circle. Now, if I want to redraw this middle line and, and I want to redraw it in an original geometry, not the Penrose diagram, this point becomes a circle like this. And this line becomes a tube. And uh, this point becomes another circle. And this is another part of a uh, system. So the way that we tend to interpret that is that the right hand side, this corner, is basically your left black hole, and this is a horizon, sorry, right black hole, and this is the horizon of the right black hole. This is another horizon of the left black hole, and this is a space time outside the left black hole. And this is a 
joint singularity for both black holes. And the wormhole geometry is simply space-time ending in a black hole. Sorry, it's, uh, a wormhole geometry is basically a black hole connected by two and ends with another black hole in another space-time. And you can see that here, if I want to go slightly upper in time, it's t equal to one. I have a similar uh, right black hole geometry that ending in the horizon this is this region. And now I have a region of space-time, this cylinder type object, which comes from this line, which is inside the wormhole. And now I have another black hole with the horizon at this point, at this circle, which is my left black hole. And as time passes, this interior of the wormhole gets larger while the right and left black hole stays the same. Now, let me get a bit more precise and talk about the actual mathematics. You can forget this wormhole geometry and come back to this uh, assumption that every point in, the, in this diagram is actually a point-like object. So we have this Penrose diagram. We have a boundary, which is two point-like objects. The Hilbert space is, of course, the tensor product of this HL times HR. This tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces. And we have Hamiltonian, which is a sum of a Hamiltonian acting on the left system and the right system. There is no interaction between these two systems. And uh, an important fact is the boundary state at time equal to zero. So the state of this, at, at this, the state of the quantum state at these two points is given by the specific state, which is called a thermal field double or TFD state, which is, uh, which is written in this form is sum over energy eigens, eigenvalues e to the minus beta over two is a thermal factor times ei and the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian on the left system and against the Hamiltonian on the right system. This is nothing but a canonical purification of the thermal state with temperature beta. And this temperature beta is basically the temperature of the black hole on the left or right. This is the concrete explanation description of the boundary system. And for the bulk, we, can, we know that uh, it's described by the space, by the sheet of space between these two boundaries. And, uh, but we somehow have a hard time understanding Hamiltonian or the Hilbert space of the bulk with the quantum gravity and it's complex. Is there any question up to this point? Actually, I do have a question. Uh -huh. um, choice of state at time zero. Like, I'm assuming this is like an assumption you're making, or um, why, so why if, this state and not some other state? Why this particular one? So, because uh, basically, state on the boundary not identifies your geometry as well. It tells you what geometry, what sheet of paper it sits in, in sit between these two boundaries. And it could be disconnected geometry, it could be connected geometry. And people know that uh, in order to make this wormhole type geometry, you have to use this type of state. And in particular, this is uh, easier to understand by the fact that this state is a purification of a thermal state. So if you trace out another boundary, you end up with a thermal state. So for example, if you trace out the left boundary, you end up with a thermal state on the right system. And the thermal state is the correct explanation of a black hole. And that is what the right system is. So it's, it's natural to start with purification of thermal state. All right, thank you. <laughs> Do we have under, any other question? If not, I think you can continue. Thank you. So let me just go through a consistency check, consistency check between bulk and boundary just to, to practice with this picture. Suppose that you inject a signal on the lower left on the boundary or a symptotic region in the bulk. So here I'm going to insert a signal and see if it's possible to receive the signal in the right boundary. The answer is no, and we can see that consist this is the answer. You can see this answer both from the bulk picture and from the boundary picture. In the bulk picture, the reason is that in order to signal for the signal to go from lower left to upper right, it had to travel 
with an angle more than 45 degree, which means that you have to go faster than the speed of light. And that's impossible. On the other hand, in the boundary picture and this, these two points, for the, from the point of view of these two points with Hamiltonian, we know that this, the Hamiltonian on the right does not interact with Hamiltonian on the left. And of course, with no interaction, you cannot send a signal from one system to another system. So this is a fact, and that is why we call this uh, wormholes, normal wormholes, non-traversable, meaning that you cannot send a signal from one side of the wormhole to the other side. But uh, certain uh, smart people realize how you can make this wormhole traversable. So the idea is that you add, on the boundary side, at time equal to zero, you, you add a very simple and small coupling, which is, it could be, you can think of it as a, uh, this, this coupling that I'm writing here. You have n qubits on the left, you have n qubits on the right, you add terms like ZZ between first qubit on the left, first qubit on the right, and then you add Z2, Z2 on the first, second qubit on the left, multiple second qubit on the right, and so on. You normalize this thing by n number of qubits, and you multiply a small g coupling. This Z choice is not canonical. You can do basically everything. But when you introduce this coupling at time equal to zero, and modify your g to be a right value of this value of g, then you would see that the net effect of this coupling in the bulk is introducing something called a negative energy shock wave, which effectively grabs your signal, move it here outside this uh, wormhole region, and release it here. So it basically allows you to send a signal from the lower left to upper right, and you see that this picture looks broken, but this is an only an artifact of the Penrose diagram, and this particle is actually free falling from here to here, and this is a statement that now the right boundary is in the light cone of this point in the left. So they showed that with this thing, and using the gravitation, with this coupling, and using the gravitational picture, you can send a signal from one boundary to another boundary, and therefore you can make your wormhole traversable. So this is the effect that can be understood by this negative energy shock wave in the bulk. And the boundary point of view is content of this stock and we want to understand how this thing happening in the boundary. But before moving forward, I have to give you a quick comment that why this sending of signal from lower left to upper right is called teleportation. And this is because it's coupling, every term is coupling commutes. And hence, you can change this protocol properly by, you can implement this protocol only by measurement and controlled operations. So then sending a signal from lower left to upper right could look like a teleportation. It's not a very important comment, but I'm just saying that because I may use the term teleportation and sending signal and state transfer interchangeably. And this is all because this coupling is a classical couple. So if you were not following this gravitational picture so far is, is okay because from this point I'm going to only focus on quantum circuits and the boundary circuit and move to plain quantum information. To do so I have to introduce a circuit that's implementing the boundary operation and I have to go through the dictionary of constructing the circuit. So on the boundary, I'm going to insert this operation, have this coupling, and receive the signal on the other boundary. Now, this is a circuit corresponding to the same phenomenon. I start at with the TFT state time equal to zero. This is the initial state. In the circuit, time also goes upward. And I have this left boundary that is represented by these two circuit lines. It's a thick line and a narrow line. So this is both constituted by left boundary. Thick line contains almost all of the qubits, all of the n qubits, and the narrow line contains probably, and thin line contains uh, maybe one or two qubits when I'm going to put signal on. When I'm going to act on the boundary, I don't uh, modify all qubits. I'm, I'm going to only touch one or two or three qubits at a time, a small number of qubits, and that those are the qubits and the signal qubits which are represented by this line. So this is my left Hilbert space. 
Similarly, this is my right over space. And then I'm going to insert this operation, quantum channel, or just anything that you can imagine, operation E at time minus t. Therefore, I have to sandwich with some time evolution, move this operation to negative times. Is here happening. So this is a, a circular implementation of this insertion. Then I have this uh, coupling between left and right boundaries which is in the circuit implemented in this form. And it's not acting on the signal cube. It doesn't matter. You can imagine it's acting or not acting. It's, it's not a crucial thing because there are very few of them. And this coupling is very, very weak. And then you have to receive your signal on the boundary, which means that you have to time evolve forward and get some kind of psi out at. So, this is a circuit, and I'm going to work on its implementation of the boundary uh, quantum system. And now the question is how and why and when this circuit teleports. And look, this is a rather surprising phenomenon, because you insert your signal here. You time evolve with a scrambling and pretty complicated Hamiltonian for a long time. So the signal that you insert at this point get totally dissipated here. And then you couple it with a very, very weak coupling to another system, and you time evolve it further again. So it's just like scrambling, doing some operation, and just like some random looking operation again. And somehow, mysteriously, you get your state back. So uh, I find it very surprising that you get a signal from this point of the circuit to the other point. And, uh, we will see further in the rest of our talk that this circuit, this teleportation circuit, works in two regimes, as I said. One is, a, one is a regime that's unexpected from gravity. It has low capacity, and it works in very high temperatures. And the other regime that it works is the teleportation through the actual geometrical wormhole that happens at low temperature and has high capacity, and it's basically what you expect from. Uh, wormhole, some a part, a signal going through a wormhole. So is there any question up to this point? There is a question in the chat. Um, the question is, is the dissipative time evolution necessary or just making a stronger statement might, um, than might otherwise be expected? Sorry, what time evolution? The dissipative time evolution. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, what, um, sorry, I don't. So e, e to the I H L T L. Oh, yeah, this is, yes, this is necessary. If you don't have this time evolution, then the signal, oh, dissipative. Oh, sorry, I, I couldn't hear the word. So if you don't have this time evolution, the signal is simply going to get traced out. You will not get it here. This is necessary. You need to have this time evolution and you scramble the signal to here. And an important fact is that this HL and HR are related. They're not totally arbitrary Hamiltonians. HR is basically uh, transpose of HL. Is there any other question? I cannot see any other questions, so I think you can go on. Okay, thank you. So I said there are two regimes, and I'm going to study these regimes one by one. So I'm going to go to the first regime of teleportation. We have to stick the circuit again. So as I said, this regime works best for long, for large times, TL equal to TR, be large numbers. And now I assume that the thermal field double is at infinite temperature. Therefore, it looks like a collection of bell pairs. It's the fact that TFT at infinite temperature is nothing but bell pairs. And now I consider insertion of the signal. So by basically tracing out the signal qubit and inserting a, my favorite state psi in and basically resetting this qubit. In the previous slide, I left it free how you want to uh, insert a signal, but now I choose a choose a method which is basically literally inserting your favorite state into this circuit. 
And now you can see that with this simple circuit, you can get at, at infinite temperature, you can easily get the psi in be equal to the psi out. So this circuit simply to the force. And you can see that, for example, with this analytical calculation with non-local non -local random Hamiltonians, this is a signal that you get as a function of time. At time equal to zero, as I said, the psi in just gets traced out, so you get no signal in psi out. But as time passes, you see that at some point you get a perfect signal out. And this is happening for a particular value of g and at an infinite temperature. I'm going to explain in a few slides of why this is happening, but for now, I'm going to note that this is a very weak teleportation protocol and it can send only one qubit. You cannot send a q3. It's simply is powerful enough to send a single two-dimensional quantum system and not anymore. And in fact, you can see this, uh, you can see this as, as follows. This random unitary time evolution is a resource for sending a single qubit. So if this e to the minus IHT is, is T is large and this time evolution looks like a random unitary and it's powerful enough for sending only one qubit. And you can use this intuition, for example, to study systems like spin chains or random quantum circuits. And the spin chain or random quantum circuits, when it's chaotic, looks like, at earlier times, it looks like many parallel random unitaries. It's, it's an intuitive picture, we can make it precise, but for, for presentation, you can assume that the spin chain is basically a lot of random unitaries in parallel, and each one of them can teleport one qubit. So basically, if you're Hamiltonian, is an extended one-dimensional object. You have hope that at early times, not too early, but not too late, you can send many qubits with this protocol. But as time passes, this random blocks get larger and larger as time evolution of a random circuit evolves. And then you have less random blocks. Therefore, you can send less qubits. And as time passes so to infinity, your, your time evolution, even with a spin chain, looks like a huge random block of unitary, and you can use it to send only one qubit. So this is a very limited capacity system, and in early times, you might be able to send more than one qubit. So now I'm gonna go through a very quick explanation of how these things work. I'm not gonna talk about the details, but it's just like more like a teaser to see how in uh, intuitively, why this is a very simple calculation and how this thing works. So you can take your original circuit, you do some transpose tricks and modify this and massage it to the, a circuit like, like this one. So you have these unitaries which are your time evolution and uh, this is more or less equivalent to a circuit of this form. And now here I have two qubits, two signal qubits, one on the left and one on the right and to output signal qubits, one on the left and one on the right. And you can see that when you do the simpler two design averaging or scrambling averaging or OTOC calculation, it's the basic fact that this circuit effectively acts by phase on the maximally entangled state on the two, two systems and does nothing on every other state. So basically it's a conditional phase on the maximally entangled states. And you can see that this operation can lead to, to teleportation of one qubit from lower left to upper right, but this is not a powerful operation because you only change the sign of one state in the whole Hilbert space. So it cannot be used to send more than one qubit. Uh, but uh, as I said, this is uh, only a, intuitive or just like explanation of why this calculation is very simple. It's, um, yeah. Is there any question at this point? I don't think there are questions, so. Okay, thank you. So let me say a few words about potential experimental implementation of this protocol and what you need to do this. So first you have to be able to implement this fail pair 
at time equal to zero at the infinite temperature. In fact, if you can implement actual TFT states, which are which is a much harder state to prefer, then you would hope to see even the teleportation through the actual wormholes. But for this one, I'm going to keep it simple and assume that you can prepare only bell curves. Then you would be you would need to do backwards and forward time evolution to implement this vertical. You have to be able to implement this weak coupling between left and right. And then you have to be able to do local control, like inserting and deleting qubits and making measurements in output. And there are many different uh, potential proposals to do this. Uh, one example is just like it's three kicked icing kicked quantum icing model. When you alternate between these two, you, you assume that your time evolution is uh, repeating this U, which is in itself made of UK times UI. UK is built from this individual XIs and UI. It's just like this icing Hamiltonian with a transverse field. And you alternate between UK and UI, and you keep doing that until you, and in this form, you can have a time evolution, which is a scrambling. And you can see that this would lead to the teleportation, simple teleportation. And in fact, you can see that uh, we have a numerical analysis for, N, for seven qubits on the right and seven qubits on the left, and which are these dots. And you see that at certain values of G, you get a peak of the signal. So you get a signal out in the other boundary. And the red line, is an analytical result that we have from coming from random matrix theory. And you see that the, the variable agree. And this is, again, coming from the fact that this is a simple system to analyze. And you can have good analytical results. If there is no other question, I will lead to the second regime of teleportation, which is the one which is this truly geometric and a signal that is actually going through a geometrical wormhole. No question? Okay. So this is the second regime of teleportation. Remember that both regimes of teleportation are happening within the circuit. One within the circuit is supposed to teleport through the wormhole, but we saw that at very late times, we can still teleport. And this is, which was our first regime. And this is something that you don't see from the gravitational picture. But earlier time, and at low temperature, you can see, you expect the signals to go through, the, through an actual geometrical wormhole. And we want to understand this phenomenon from the boundary point of view. And that is our second regime that I'm going to talk about. But before going through this wormhole explanation and coming back to the circuit, I have to go through a detour and talk about the operator size distribution for two slides. So bear with me. This is a, a simple explanation and introduction to operator size. So suppose that you have a single Pauli operator O or a small operator O. It might be two or three Pauli operators. And you time evolve it. So if you have O of t, time evolved by Hamiltonian. And you expand it in this Pauli basis. So these are n qubit power the operators and you have some coefficients cp so this is some this is an expansion of this operator in the power basis and then you have a notion of size of power the operators which is nothing but the number of x y or z's one qubit x y or z is appearing in the expansion of p so in a single x1 has size one and x1 z3 has size two and and so on so we know that the size of an operator is will grow with time if at time equal to zero this o of t this operator is basically a single Pauli operator where the cp is non-zero cp coefficient are supported on one qubit uh what size one operators but as time passes, this operator gets larger and larger, and the CPs get wider and wider. And uh, here is a plot. It's, a, it's not a real data. It's just for illustration of the size distribution. 
So here you see this is a, the CP coefficients are introduced, are basically ordered by their size of P. And vertical axis is a real part of CP and the horizontal axis is the imaginary part of CP. And you can see that time passes, the size distribution gets wider and wider, and this coefficient, the larger and larger CPs gets activated as time passes. Because O of T, this operator, is a Hermitian operator, the CP coefficients are all real, and that's why this distribution of CPs are all concentrated on, are all sitting on this vertical plane where the imaginary part of CP is zero. Is there any question? I think you can go on. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce something a, less a bit less conventional, and this is a thermal operator size distribution. So now instead of expanding to OT, I'm going to expand OT times rho beta to the power of one half. This rho beta is my uh, uh, thermal density matrix of temperature beta. This is a simple operator like this one, like the previous one. But now the CP coefficients are not real. They are complex numbers because famously the product of two Hermitian operators is not Hermitian, so there is no reason to expect the CPs to be real. And in fact, they are complex numbers. And somehow the magical thing that happens that comes from uh, gravity intuition is that the size distribution for the systems that have gravity dual and or near saturating the chaos bound, the CP coefficients are not randomly looking complex numbers. They have an order. They basically wind and they stay coherent. They're not real anymore but they, can, they obtain a linear phase as you increase the temperature, at, as, as increase beta. At beta equal to zero is just an ordinary size distribution, but as you increase beta, they start winding in a nice and linear way in size. And you see that for each particular size, the CP coefficients stay on the line, which is, which is basically this, this angle is, depends on your uh, on your temperature, and the whole picture stays coherent. So this is what we call size winding, and this is a low temperature phenomena, and mostly happens, uh, we believe that it's happening near scrambling time and where the actual traversable, geometric traversable warhole is active. This is a phenomenon that you would hope to understand even with no gravity background, because it's simply an expansion of an operator in the Pauli basis. But now I'm going to explain to you why it's related to the traverse of a warhole, and it's my basic last very important slide. So suppose that you insert your operator at the lower left of the diagram. So this is where you start your operation. And you hope to get the operator on the upper right. So you hope the signal that inserted here come out at upper right. And if you look at the state of, for example, this system at time equal to zero is the state that's basically made of some O of, o of T times a term of a double state. So this is the state on these two boundaries. And we know that there is an operation that maps a state on the Hilbert space and a, dub, and a double Hilbert space to so an operator on one Hilbert space. Basically, you take any ket that you have on the second Hilbert space and make it to a bra. So this, this way, there is a way to map operators on two copies of Hilbert states on the two copies of Hilbert space and rearrange this vector elements to a matrix on only one Hilbert space. And this is this is a conventional thing to do. And if you do that at operator at state of time equal to zero, you see that the operator corresponding to the state insertion is nothing but OT times rho beta to the power of one half. This is the thermal operator I have. And the operator corresponds to the state, and the operator corresponds to the case when you insert your signal at the upper right, 
correspond to the similar object, the rho beta to the power of power one half times OT. So the only difference between the signal in the lower left and upper right is order of OT and rho beta. So somehow you want the coupling at time equal to zero map this operator to this operator and change the order of OT and rho beta. But now with the understanding of size winding, we know that an operator OT times rho beta to the power of one half has a size distribution, which has a clockwise winding and this far. And the operator inserted in the upper right because it's simply a complex conjugate of this operator, has a, a clockwise winding, which is a mirror of this one. So it's a counterclockwise winding. It's wind it winds in the opposite direction. So you're supposed to map this clockwise winding into a counterclockwise winding. And now comes the last ingredient, which is the coupling that's supposed to do this magic and mapping this state, this operator to the, the left column to the right column. And you can see that what this uh, size distribution, what this coupling does is simply it adds a linear phase proportional to G to the size distribution. So this coupling, the coupling's job is to wind the size uh, distribution. And with the right value of G, you can see that you can get this size distribution which has a clockwise winding with the help of this coupling, unwind it and wind it in the opposite direction. And in this way, you map this picture clockwise winding to the counterclockwise winding. And hence, you map the operator inserted in the lower left to the operator inserted in the upper right. And this is how uh, actual traverse of wormholes work. So here is stop for questions. I think you can continue. Okay, thank you. Yes. So this, uh, this picture of size winding and size distribution has uh, is, is basically related to more or less the same as this size momentum conjecture, which was proposed by Lonnie Suskin and uh, Henry Lin, Hong Maldusena, and Ying Zhao. And it's basically the idea that when you release a particle in the bulk in a quantum system of quantum gravity, its momentum gets boosted and it gets multiplied and gets wider. And the momentum distribution of this particle is basically very similar or is conjectured to be the same as the size distribution of the operator creating this, uh, this particle in the boundary because the operator also gets larger. So this is, for example, in a, sim a simple size distribution and the boundary, you start small and as time passes, it gets wider and wider and wider. And we only care about the first few ones because when it concentrates, it gets messy and it's probably not nice to gravitational, but at early times it gets wider and wider and this this widening and growth of the operator size is very similar to the uh, growth of the momentum distribution wave function of a particle in the bulk. And what we are adding here is, is saying that now we can have a phase in the size distribution. And the phase of a size distribution can be attributed to the phase of a momentum distribution. But what we know in the undergrad quantum mechanics is that the phase of a momentum wave function is basically your introduced, indicates your position wave function, indicates your position. So this size winding is basically giving you information about the position of a particle in the bulk. And this position is measured from the black hole horizon. And you can see that it's, Actually, in the regime that size winding works, it gives you a very accurate description of a particle getting exponentially closer and closer to the black hole horizon. 
And this coupling, what it does is just like moves you from one side of the horizon to the other side of the horizon, as it was clearly explained in the paper of Maldusena, Stanford, and Yang with this uh, translation operators. But uh, here we would like to say that, I mean, I find it very interesting because somehow I don't refer to gravity at all. And I can look at the size distribution of operator on the boundary and I get a toy example of the position and momentum wave function of a particle falling into the bulk by only looking at the size distribution and interpreting that as a momentum wave function with the appropriate phase. So somehow you can, uh, it's, it's, it certainly does not give you a complete gravitational explanation but it gives you a, somehow a toy version of how this bulk direction emerges. And a very interesting fact is that even with non-local non -local Hamiltonians, just if you have a GUE Hamiltonian, you still have a very, very weak and non-precise and non-coherent form of size winding. You don't have a perfect thing like gravity, but you still have some kind of size winding and you still have, get a little bit of signal of the operator out at the right time. So the same physics that governs uh, actual traversable wormholes in the geometries exists in a much weaker form. And a little bit of that physics exists, I would say, in non-local Hamiltonians and many, many different quantum systems. So with that, I reached to my conclusion. Uh, so in this talk, I introduced a circuit corresponding to traverse of a wormhole phenomena, and I explained that it works in two regimes. One is the simpler to understand and experimental implement late time low capacity regime. And this is a regime that the phenomena does not have a clear gravitational explanation of anything going through a wormhole. And the same circuit, the same circuit works at low temperature and intermediate times through a different mechanism, which was the size winding. And now it can have higher capacity and would correspond to a signal going through an actual wormhole. As I said, the size winding is strong form existing gravitational system. I think it is sufficient to have a maximum chaos of size winding, but we can approximate size winding exists even in GUE or GOE Hamiltonians. And it provides a bit of further evidence for the size momentum conjecture. And an interesting future direction is that we, we would like to understand the size winding with no reference to gravity. You would be able to, under, to look at this operator that is evolving with time. Simply, you have an operator O and you conjugate it by some Hamiltonian. It gets larger and larger. And we want to understand why the size distribution starts winding and why it acquires a phase. And lastly, I want to talk I want to say that another future direction is low temperature TFD experiments, when you can simply see the teleportation through an actual uh, simulation of a wormhole. And with that, I would like to finish. Thank you and finish the talk. Thank you very much. I think we don't have a way to clap, but let's, you know, let's make this a clap uh, virtually. Um, we have some time for further questions if people have. Um, so there is a question here in the chat. Yeah, let me go to the chat now. I think. I can read it for you. I guess uh, people who see the recording will also read the chat. Uh, the question is, should I think of there being connections between bulk position of a particle or the winding phase and the value of beta, which also describes temperature? Uh, yes, yes. So let me go to the right slide. Yes, here if beta is very small, is zero, it's basically this operator, this rho beta to the power of one half is the identity operator and therefore these coefficients are all real coefficients and you have no size winding at all. So this is a phenomenon that only happens at low temperatures. So yes. And uh, so the answer is yes. And I, I think as you decrease your temperature, you might get a stronger, stronger size winding. Although I should say that uh, don't have a very good understanding of this thing. The only, there are basically two ways that you know you can get the size winding feature. One is that basically you can follow how the traverse of wormholes work and reverse engineer that. 
to the size winding picture, which gives you more or less big evidence. And the, on the, other, the other region that you can study is uh, SYK system when uh, Xiaolang Shi and Alexander Strecker introduced a formalism to compute the actual size distribution for the SYK model. And there you can analytically continue and see this winding happens, but it happens near a scrambling time. If you wait too much, all the size distribution gets messy and concentrated in the final value. But the answer is yes. We still have time for one more question. I lost my chat window. All right, there seems to be no more questions. Oh no, one question just arrived. Um, you can also unmute people if they. Yes, if you want to ask questions yourself, just let me know, and or you can unmute yourself. Um, Anant is asking if uh, the coupling between HL and HR is it a physical coupling or is if it violates causality. Uh, well, this is a. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly a physical coupling they can implement in an experiment. Whether it violates causality, I mean, in an experiment, you have two boundary systems and you can act on both of them at the same time and that's, that's totally fine. So it does not violate causality. But if you confine yourself in the bulk geometry, there are two things that are happening at the same time the very far distance, it still doesn't violate causality, but uh, and the boundary is simply a coupling. The answer is no. That's it. Any other question? We have a nice question. It's like, why it is called the negative energy shock wave of the bulk? Do you have any so, explanation for that? Yeah, uh, so let me go to the right picture. So basically the idea is that, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so basically the idea is that if you insert an operator here, it produces a normal shock wave, which of course has a positive energy because uh, whatever you do normally, if, if it's not coupled in a, re in a weird way, uh, it introduces some positive energy. And the, the effect of that is this the positive energy shock wave and it moves your signal further into singularity. So the normal shock waves that people know make the wormhole longer and the signal that's traveling here would go upward and get to the singularity faster. So, and that's happened with the positive G, which is the, the energy that you implement here. But now it is a, you change the sign of G and you depose uh, somehow you, I, I believe in the bulk, it, it's a bit tricky to understand because you cannot see that in the boundary Hamiltonian, but in the bulk dense, uh, energy momentum tensor, you see that you, enter, you lower your, uh, the value of the, the energy momentum tensor, I believe. So it reduces your energy. It's not something that can happen normally in, in in a universe with in in our world, I think, because they always have uh, small energy conditions. But... So the normal wormholes are not traversable. You have to do some magic. I think we can wrap it up unless somebody has a last. Very quick question. Um, I, I would like to thank you for giving thank this you. talk and, uh, I, and also would like to thank all the participants, which have been um, actually plenty. We were like around 48, 50 uh, people connected. So thank you very much for joining us and, uh, and um, thanks Sefer again for the talk. And, uh, thank you so much for organizing this. Oh, we have... Uh, Question from Grant. 
No, I was just clapping. Oh, oh, that's clap. Okay, that's great. All right, thank you very much. See you next week.